Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains that even if a devotee wishes the Lord to fulfill a particular desire, the devotee should not be considered a Sakama devotee, a devotee with a motive. In Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Chatur vidha bhajante mam jana sukritinarjuna arta jignashur artati yanicha bharatarshaba. O best among the bharatas, Arjuna. Four kinds of pious men render devotional service unto me distressed, desire of wealth, inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute. The Arta and the Artarti, who approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead for relief from misery or for some money, are not Sakama Bhaktas, although they appear to be. Being neophyte devotees, they're just ignorant. Later, in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, Udara Sarva Evaiti, although they are magnanimous, oh, Oh, he's, excuse me, I didn't read that right. Uh, later in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, Udara Sarva Evate, they are all magnanimous. Although in the beginning a devotee may harbor some desire, in due course of time it will vanish. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam enjoins, Akama Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kama Udharadi, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, Yajita Purushamparam. A person who has broader intelligence, whether he's full of all material desire, is free from material desire, or has a desire for liberation, must by all means worship the Supreme Hall, the personality of Godhead. Even if one wants something material, he should pray to no one but the Lord to fulfill his desire. If one approaches a demigod for the fulfillment of his desires, he's considered nastabuddhi, bereft of all good sense. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Kamais tastaya ritagyana, prapadyante nyatevata, tam tam niyamam astaya, prakricha niyatasvaya. Those whose minds are distorted by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. Lakshmi Devi advises all devotees who approach the Lord with material desires that according to her practical experience, the Lord is Kamadev. Thus, there's no need to ask him for anything material. She says that everyone should simply serve the Lord without any motive. Since the Supreme Personality of Godhead is sitting in everyone's heart, he knows everyone's thoughts, and in due course of time, he will fulfill all desires. Therefore, let us completely depend on the service of the Lord without bothering him with our material requests. Ah. Hmm. Krishna. <laughs> so nice. Ah. Text 22. Now, that, that was Lakshmi Devi herself advising that everyone should just serve Krishna. <laughs> so, people are very interested in getting Lakshmi Devi's favor because they have some material motive. They approach Lakshmi Devi for material wealth, prosperity. But she's saying, look, don't ask for those things. Just serve Krishna and uh, everything will come to you. You just serve Krishna. Uh, Text 22. O supreme, unconquerable Lord, and this is Lakshmi continuing, when they become absorbed in thoughts of material enjoyment, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva 
as well as other demigods and demons, undergo severe penances and austerities to receive my benedictions. But I do not favor anyone, however great he may be, unless he's always engaged in the service of your lotus feet, because I always keep you within my heart. I cannot favor anyone but a devotee. Hmm. That's interesting. Interesting to see how that is because it looks like there's in the world today these great demons who have a lot of wealth and opulence, and that comes from Srimati Lakshmi Devi. But here she's saying, uh, But I do not favor anyone, however great he may be, unless he's a devotee. I cannot favor anyone but a devotee. And then on the other hand, we also hear how. A lot of times the devotees of Krishna don't have uh, much opulence. They live very simply and very without wealth. They live in a poor state, a lot of devotees. We, saw that, we see that with Lord Chaitanya's followers. So this is interesting here. Let's see how this is. <laughs> and Prabhupada discusses about this. Sometimes there are apparent contradictions, but there really aren't any because they get explained in the light of devotion. So, Lakshmi saying, I don't favor anyone but a devotee. So let's, here's Prabhupada's commentary. In this verse, the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, clearly states, she does not bestow her favor on any materialistic person. Okay, here's the answer. This is so good, this is so good. Here's the answer. Next sentence, although sometimes a materialist becomes very opulent in the eyes of another materialist, such opulence is bestowed upon him by goddess Durga, a material expansion of the goddess of fortune, not by Lakshmi Devi herself. Huh. Which means their so-called opulence is short-lived. Those who desire material wealth worship Durga Devi with the following mantra. I'm not going to say it. It's Sanskrit. I'm not familiar with. Translation of it is, O oh, worshipful mother Durga Devi, please give me wealth, strength, fame, a good wife, and so on. By pleasing goddess Durga, one can obtain such benefits, but since they're temporary, they result only in maya sukha, illusory happiness. So Durga Devi is a material expansion of Lakshmi Devi. It's a material expansion. He's not actually Lakshmi Devi herself. She's an illusory expansion of Lakshmi Devi. And so her benedictions are also illusory, which means they're temporary. They have no lasting permanence. So what appears to be so wonderful in the beginning turns out to be horrible in the end because you can't keep it. It's a cause of suffering in the end. They result in illusory happiness. Ah. Prabhupada's commentary continued. As stated by Prahlad Maharaj, Maya Sukhaya Baram Udvahato Vimudan those who work very hard for material benefits are vimudas, foolish rascals, because such happiness will not endure. On the other hand, devotees like Prahlad and Dhruva Maharaj achieved extraordinary material opulences. Such opulences were not maya sukha. When a devotee acquires unparalleled opulences, the direct gifts of the goddess of fortune who resides in the heart of Narayan. So the real opulence is not temporary, it's eternal. And it's a direct gift of the goddess of fortune, Dhruva Maharaj, at his own planet, which is not destroyed. 
Material opulence is a person obtains by offering prayers to the goddess Durga or temporary. As described in Bhagavad Gita, Antavanta palam tesham tad bhavat yalpamedasham. Men of meager intelligence desire temporary happiness. We have actually seen that one of the disciples of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur wanted to enjoy the property of his spiritual master. And the spiritual master, being merciful toward him, gave him the temporary property, but not the power to preach the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all over the world. That special mercy of the power to preach is given to a devotee who does not want anything material from his spiritual master, but wants only to serve him. Uh, yeah. Hmm. See that with uh, Arjuna also in the conflict with Duryodhan. <laughs> Duryodhan wanted the property. He wanted the kingdom. The, the Kuravas, they wanted the kingdom. And Arjuna just wanted to serve Krishna. So there was a conflict there because Krishna wanted Arjuna to manage the kingdom. <laughs> So ultimately, Arjuna and the Pandavas were victorious. So here Prabhupada is pointing out a kind of fratricidal conflict where he doesn't mention who it is, but a god brother simply wanted the property of the spiritual master. But the devotee wanted to serve the spiritual master. So he got the property, but he didn't get the empowerment to actually preach and serve the spiritual master, which was the real opulence. So it's not exactly the same as Arjuna, because Arjuna and his brothers did get the kingdom. What was left of the kingdom Actually, the kingdom was destroyed pretty much in the battle of Kurukshetra because all the great leaders, uh, everyone was, was killed in the battle. So there really wasn't much left to manage like that after Kurukshetra. But that was of really no concern to Arjuna and the Pandavas because they just wanted to serve Krishna. They wanted to please Krishna. <laughs> So that they never lost. They always have that, because they have Krishna. So Prabhupada not interested in, didn't want the property of his spiritual master. He wanted to serve his spiritual master. And what the spiritual master asked him to do as service was to preach all over the world, especially in English, but all over the world. And so he got that. This Prabhupada continues, the story of the demon Ravana illustrates this point. Although Ravana tried to abduct the goddess of fortune Sita Devi from the custody of Lord Ramachandra, he could not possibly do so. The Sita Devi he forcibly took with him was not the original Sita Devi, but an expansion of Maya or Durga Devi. As a result, instead of winning the favor of the real goddess of fortune, Ravana and his whole family were vanquished by the power of Durga Devi. Hmm. Yes, yeah, Sita Devi is the goddess of fortune in her form as Sita Devi. He tried to steal Sita, but he got an illusory form. He got a, a Maya Sita, or Durga Devi. And as a result, he was killed, and his whole family was destroyed, and uh, all his demon friends were destroyed. <laughs> 
so that's what happens. <laughs> no one can take the goddess of fortune away from Krishna. It's an illusion. So they think they're taking something away. It's an example of how that works is like a, a child may look at the moon and say, I want that. I want that. Bring that thing. So how are you going to bring the moon out of the sky to give to a little child? So you get a mirror. And then the child has the mirror, and he's looking at the reflection of the moon in the mirror, and he thinks he has the moon. <laughs> it's like that. I just read some. Expanded like that reflection, not the actual moon, not the actual Sita, not the actual Lakshmi Devi, an illusory form. Okay. Text 23. These wonderful prayers of Lakshmi Devi. O oh, infallible one, your lotus palm is the source of all benediction. Therefore, your pure devotees worship it, and you very mercifully place your hand on their heads. I wish that you may also place your hand on my head. Although you already bear my insignia of golden streaks on your chest, I regard this honor as merely a kind of false prestige for me. You show your real mercy to your devotees, not to me. Of course, you are the supreme absolute controller, and no one can understand your motives. Wow, Lakshmi is showing some desire to... She's, she's glorifying devotional service, she's glorifying the devotees. And here she is, mm -hmm. eternal companion of the Lord, and never leaves his side, and she's... She's saying, yeah, but you show your real mercy to your devotees, not to me. <laughs> That's how attractive devotional service is. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, I was just thinking how she's desiring the lotus hand of the Lord on her head and the gopis who are so intimately intimate pastimes with the lord they're desiring the lord's lotus hand on their breasts so <laughs> lakshmi devi is a little showing a little uh, uh agitation or <laughs> you show your real mercy to your devotees not to me i'm just your wife <laughs> But you're having these intimate relationships with your devotees. <laughs> this is Krishna. This is Krishna's personality is wonderful. <laughs> it's not material. Materially, these things are horrendous. Because they're just a reflection of the reality. They don't help anyone make things, make material attachment even worse. <clears throat> False ego flare up. But spiritually, it's very <clears throat> wonderful pastimes to understand the personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada's commentary, in many places the Shastras describe the Supreme Personality <clears throat> as being more inclined toward his devotees than toward his wife, who always remains on his chest. In Bhagavatam it stated, uh, some Sanskrit I'm not familiar with, Prabhupada continues, Here, Krishna plainly says that his devotees are more dear to him than Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Shankarshan, the original cause of creation, the goddess of fortune, or even his own self. Mm. I'm going to read that Sanskrit, even though I'm going to stumble on it. Natata me priyatama atma yonir na shankara na cha sankarshano na shrir naivatma cha yatabhavan. That is a beautiful verse. That's from the 11th canto, Bhagavatam. Krishna says his devotees are more dear to him 
then Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Shankarshan, and the goddess of fortune, or even his own self. Hmm. Of course, they are expanded from him. It's <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, Lord Shankarshan is uh, Vishnu expansion. He is Krishna. And the goddess of fortune is an expansion of his eternal energy. So he's saying his devotees, very interesting. It's the devotion, devotional service that is so attractive to Krishna. Krishna's the all attractive, but he's attracted to devotional service. And devotees, <clears throat> that's where the devotion is. It's in the devotees. And even Krishna himself says, it's more attractive to me than even my own self in devotion. Mm. Elsewhere in Srimad Bhagavatam Sukadev, Goswami says, <clears throat> Translation, the Supreme Lord, who can award liberation to anyone, showed more mercy toward the go gopis than to Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, even the goddess of fortune, <clears throat> who is his own wife and is associated with his body. She always remains on his chest. Similarly, Srimad Bhagavatam also states, the gopis received benedictions from the Lord that neither Lakshmi Devi nor the most beautiful dancers in the heavenly planets could attain. In the rasa dance, the Lord showed his favor to the most fortunate gopis by placing his arms on their shoulders and dancing with each of them individually. No one can compare with the gopis who received the causeless mercy of the Lord. And chief most of the gopis is Radharani. Now it's described elsewhere that Lakshmi Devi is an expansion of Radharani. But in that expansion as Lakshmi Devi, she does not have access to these pastimes of the Lord. Only in her original manifestation as Srimati Radharani does she have access. So here, the expansion of Radharani as Lakshmi Devi is showing this bit of transcendental enviousness. It's not malicious enviousness. It's, it's a form of appreciation and glorification. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said, no one can receive the real favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead without following in the footsteps of the gopis. Even the goddess of fortune could not receive the same favor as the gopis, although she underwent severe austerities and penances for many years. Yeah, and the gopis are expansions of Radharani. But Lakshmi Devi is a different type of expansion. So wherever Krishna is, Radharani will expand to be with him in, the, in that particular form. So when he's present in Dwarka, in all opulence, and there's some awe and reverence there, then Radharani expands as Lakshmi Devi to accompany him, and she plays the part of the perfect wife, and like this, the queen. And when he appears as Lord Ramachandra, she appears as Sita Devi to accompany him in his pastimes in the forest and his dealings with Ravana, like this. So Lakshmi Devi is always present with Krishna. brings the mind to his appearance as Lord Chaitanya. So where's Radharani in that incarnation? Combined. They're together in one. Sri <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a combined incarnation. Radha Krishna. Combined. Inconceivable. Never seen before. Overwhelming. <laughs> yeah.
And he also manifests as Gudadhar. Gudadhar Pandit. So, we want to hear more and more about Lord Chaitanya. More and more about these mystical pastimes of the Lord, these incarnations. So here, Goddess Lakshmi. So, now we're hearing Prabhupada's commentary a little bit more about what's going on here with the Lord and his Goddess of Fortune. Is, uh, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said, no one can receive the real favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead without following in the footsteps of the gopis. Even the goddess of fortune could not receive the same favor as the gopis, although she underwent severe austerities and penances for many years. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu discusses this point with the Enkat Bhat in Chaitanya Charitamrita. The Lord inquired from the Enkat Bhat, Your worshipful goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, always remains on the chest of Narayan, and she's certainly the most chaste woman in the creation. However, my Lord is Lord Sri Krishna, a cowherd boy engaged in tending cows. Why is it that Lakshmi, being such a chaste wife, wants to associate with my Lord? Just to associate with Krishna, Lakshmi abandoned all transcendental happiness in Vaikuntha, and for a long time accepted vows and regular principles and performed unlimited austerities. The Ankat but replied, Lord Krishna and Lord Narayan are one and the same, but the pastimes of Krishna are more relishable due to their sportive nature. They're very pleasing for Krishna's shaktis, since Krishna and Narayan are both the same personality Lakshmi's association with Krishna did not break her vow of chastity. Rather, it was in great fun that the goddess of fortune wanted to associate with Lord Krishna. The goddess of fortune considered that her vow of chastity would not be damaged by her relationship with Krishna. Rather, by associating with Krishna, she could enjoy the benefit of the rasa dance. If she wanted to enjoy herself with Krishna, what is the fault there? Why are you so joking about this? Lord Chaitanya replied, I know that there is no fault in the goddess of fortune, but still she could not enter into the rasa dance. We hear this from revealed scriptures. The authorities of Vedic knowledge met Lord Ramachandra in Dandakarna, and by their penances and austerities they were allowed to enter into the rasa dance. But can you tell me why the goddess of fortune Lakshmi could not get that opportunity? Yes, they became uh, gopis, these great sages. They uh, they came across the Lord in Dandakarana forest when he was banished from the kingdom, and they desired conjugal relationship with the Lord, and so they were able to enter the Rasa dance in the in a, in a following lifetime as the God, as the gopis they became the gopis. But uh, in this conversation with Vian Katbat, the Lord is saying, even they, they could become gopis by austerities and penances. But why can't the goddess Lakshmi get the opportunity? And then Vian Katbat replies again, I cannot enter into the mystery of this incident. I'm an ordinary living being. My intelligence is limited. I'm always disturbed. How can I understand the pastimes of the Supreme Lord? They're deeper than millions of oceans. Lord Chaitanya replied, Lord Krishna has a specific characteristic. He attracts everyone's heart by the mellow of his personal conjugal love. By following in the footsteps of the inhabitants of the planet known as Rajloka or Goloka Vrindavan, one can attain the shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. 
However, the inhabitants of that planet do not know that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Unaware that Krishna is the Supreme Lord, the residents of Vrindavan like Nanda Maharaj, Soda Devi, and the gopis treat Krishna as the beloved son or lover. Mother Yasoda accepts him as her son and sometimes binds him to a grinding mortar. Krishna's coward boyfriends think he's an ordinary boy, get up on his shoulders. In Goloka Vrindavan, no one has any desire other than to love Krishna. The conclusion is that one cannot associate with Krishna unless he's fully received the favor of the inhabitants of Rajabhumi. Therefore, if one wants to be delivered by Krishna directly, he must take to the service of the residents of Vrindavan, who are unalloyed devotees of the Lord. I can read that again. <laughs> Short paragraph. The conclusion is one cannot associate with Krishna unless he's fully received the favor of the inhabitants of Rajabhumi. Therefore, if one wants to be delivered by Krishna directly, he must take to the service of the residents of Vrindavan who are unalloyed devotees of the Lord. And with that, something to think about during the day taking shelter of the residents of Vrindavan. And who are the residents of Vrindavan? They're pure devotees of the Lord. But what's so unique about their purity is their mood of service to the Lord. They have no other motive than to love the Lord in um, a personal way, either as their son or their lover or their friend, like that. Or a master and servant is also available more. But nothing formal. It's all spontaneous, loving relationship. And it's very pleasing to Krishna. And there's no, there, he says here, Prabhupada explains, the residents of Vrindavan are totally unaware that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God, and even when he does extraordinary things. They simply think, wow, he's really empowered. <laughs> Boy, he's really wonderful. <laughs> wow, he lifted that hill for seven days and protected everyone from torrents of rain. Wow, that's amazing. Krishna's wonderful. <laughs> wow, he killed this big demon witch, Putna. He's just a little baby, and he, he he sucked her breast and took the poison out, and she expanded to twelve miles long and lying down and blocking everything, crashing trees when she fell. Wow, Krishna's amazing, <laughs> and he even does naughty things. He steals our butter and he steals our yogurt and he makes our babies cry and he causes all kinds of problems. But somehow we just can't get mad at him. <laughs> we try to get mad at him, but geez, when we look at him, just uh, can't get mad at him. <laughs> just love him too much. What can we do? So, that the residents of Goloka Vrindavan, they're actually unaware that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And they simply love Krishna, his pastimes, his activities. So, if you want to associate with Krishna like that, you have to take shelter of the devotees who are like that. And we hear about them. We hear about Krishna's pastimes with them. And we associate with those who are surrendering in that mood. Those who also desire a mood of Goloka Vrindavan. So that's how, that's how you get there.
It's kind of like, it's not what you know, but who you know. <laughs> Devotee's mercy. So, Srila Prabhupada, pure devotee, he is a resident of Vrindavan, and he is inviting everyone by following his instructions. We read earlier that he's mapped out a course for those that are just starting out on the path of regulative devotional mm -hmm. service which will bring one to the stage of being able to relish attachment to Krishna as a person, personality of Krishna. So if we follow his prescription to the best of our ability, then we're associating with that devotee, that resident of Vrindavan, his divine grace, Prabhupada. So, hearing is the first thing, hearing and chanting. So that's what we're doing here. And if that's all one can do, is just hear and chant about the Lord, that's devotional service. So be protected, we'll make advancement, and a little bit, little bit, develop a taste for Krishna because that's the goal that's the goal of regulative principles also is to develop a taste or a loving relationship with Krishna so Hare Krishna where's the Prabhupada